Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. We're looking at Saved by Grace. Hope everybody's okay today. Let's come before the Lord. Don't forget, uh, Piccadilly Gardens uh, Community Church uh, meets every Friday night and every Sunday morning and Sunday evening or Sunday afternoon. Uh, you're welcome to come and meet with us. And uh, we do evangelism in Manchester. Um, most days we're out uh, street preaching so you're welcome to come and join us okay uh, if you want to come to the church or if you want to come to uh, street preaching my uh, phone number is 07512790480 07512790480 uh, so let me know uh, if you want to come and uh, my name's Jay and um, we can organise uh, something for you to either to come to a meeting or meet us in Manchester if you want to help us in street preaching. Okay? <coughs> Let's come before the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace and care. We give you the praise and the glory and the honour. And Father, we pray as we look at your word that, Lord, you might bless us. And Lord, I just pray that these words would be an encouragement and a help and bring people to know you and trust in you, Lord, in your name. Please may the Holy Spirit help us, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay, if you'd like to turn to your Bibles, which is Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 to 10. And you he had made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the na desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of laughed just as the others but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus our for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What an amazing passage that is. Um, <clears throat> My mum uh, was one of the most famous clairvoyants in England. And in order to get your palm read by my mum, you had to pay twenty pounds. Now my mum is uh, a Christian, a follower of Jesus now. But it highlights that when you go to Clairvoyance you have to pay. But when you come to know Jesus it's free. It, you don't have to pay anything. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. You see, it's by faith. You believe in Jesus Christ. Anybody can do that. That can be by a man, a girl, a boy. Anybody can put their faith in Jesus. You don't have to pay to get to know God. Christianity is different from all the other religions. In Islam and Buddhism, you get saved by what you do. It's down to you. But God's salvation is what God has done. Is his free gift. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 You see, it's what God has done through his Son, Jesus Christ. There's an old hymn that says, How willing was Jesus to die that we rebel sinners might live? The life they could not take away, how ready was Jesus to give? They pierced through his hands and his feet, his body he freely resigned. 
The pains of his flesh were so great, but greater the pangs of his mind. Joseph's son. You see, the whole message is what Christ did at the cross for you. And the question is, are you willing to consider this for the meaning of your life today? The first question I want to ask is, are you spiritually dead? Imagine you are dead, and you are lied on a hospital bed. And outside the bed is a window, and the window is a big window, and it opens up into a garden in the hospital. And in the garden there are children playing, and there is someone playing the flute, and the wind is blowing. But you are dead. You cannot see the children playing in the park. You cannot hear the flute playing. You cannot feel the wind blowing. And also the sun is ablaze. And you cannot feel the sun upon your face. Because you are dead. Did you know that you are spiritually dead? That you cannot hear the word of God? You cannot feel the son of God? It says, as for you, you were dead. In your transgressions and sins, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. So with the sinner in regard to the spiritual eternal world, he sees no beauty in religion. He hears not the call of God. He is unaffected by the dying of the Saviour. And he has no interest in eternal realities. The reason why you don't know God is because you're dead spiritually. Isaiah 9 2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. A light has dawned into your life, but you cannot see it because you are walking in darkness. It says in the Bible, then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death, James 1.15. You see, you walk in the way of sin, and it brings spiritual death. You cannot see the beauty of God. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks on a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gorge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to have one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into the hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Matthew chapter excuse me, 5 verse 27 and 30. In other words, we don't realize how spiritually dead we are and how serious sin is the Lord saying look if you sin with your hand cut your hand off it's better to go into heaven with one hand than to go into hell with both hands in other words sin before a holy God is hateful he hates sin and he cannot have sin in his presence and we're in a dark place folks we're spiritually dead because we don't realize how serious sin is. There was an American football coach and he had a team and he threw um, a snake, a rattlesnake, into the football team's changing, uh, changing rooms and the footballers ran here, there and everywhere to get away from the rattlesnake. And he said, just as you run away from the snake, so run away from drink and drugs. And you know something? We don't even know the rattlesnake of sins there. That's how dead we are. We don't realize the things that we're getting in are into are poisonous and spiritually uh, will kill us because we're so blind and so dead to the evil of sin. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't realize when we sin, it brings death. It brings death. God wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you a new hope. He wants you to turn away from drinks or drugs or whatever it is that's pulling you down. You know, many of you young people are thinking that 
You've got your whole life before you and you want to try all the pleasures of the world and all the sins of the world and the glamour of the big city, but it'll only pull you down. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3 and 5, it says, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in the debauchery, lust, and drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You know, there are many people walking in the way of sin, and if you decide to turn away, they will want you to go their way, and they will mock you. But you know the way that you're going. You know that the way you are going is not right. You know that. And it's time to pull up before it's too late. Number second, not are you, are you spiritually dead? Do you know that you're controlled by Satan? You know they can put a chip in a beetle. I've seen them put a, a computer chip in a beetle and then they can control the beetle where it flies. And I've seen this experiment and, and it can be controlled by a computer. Did you know that you're being controlled by Satan at this present time? Ephesians 2.2 2 says, In which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the earth. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. There is a devil and de demonic forces against God. And demonic forces that do not want you to follow God. Okay? 1 John 3, 8. Who does what is sinful is, is the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared to us is to... Destroy the devil's work, 1 John 3, 8. Some of you might have been messing around with the occult, with tarot cards and, and, and occultish witchcraft. But you need to know it's of the devil. I've met so many people today, young people, who say they worship the devil. Do you realize the devil is an evil foe? The devil was conquered by Jesus at the cross? My dear young people, please do not follow the devil. He will destroy your work life. And he is heading for the lake of fire. And you don't want to go with him to the lake of fire now, do you? But there are many people who do not just worship Satan. Like devil worshippers. But there are many people today who don't give a thought to spiritual things. They go to work. They do their, their job. They go to the nightclubs. They have their parties. They have their sex. They have their drugs. They don't give any thought to any spiritual things, really. And to mention the devil to them means a strange word. But you are being manipulated by the devil. The devil will give you sex. The devil will give you drugs. The devil will give you fame. He will give you whatever you want. So long as you do not read this book. The moment you start reading this book is the moment you'll get attacked by the devil. And you will know that the devil is real. You will know that there is an army of evil spirits out to get you. The moment you pick up this book and read it and desire to follow it, the hound of the devil will be after you. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The God of this world is blinding people, my friends. He's blinding the young generation of today. Don't be blinded by the God of this world. And there are many scriptures that you could read. James chapter 4 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 and 18. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 and 9. John chapter 8 verse 44. My dear young people today, take the devil seriously. He is a real foe. And the only way you can deal with the devil is by the word of God and the blood of Christ. That's where you need to go right now. If you've been into witchcraft, you need to flee to the blood of Christ, because at the blood of Christ, you can defeat every, every demonic force that is trying to bring you down. 
I'm telling you this. If you muck about with the occult, it will screw your mind up. And you don't want to do that. You want to be happy and joyful and at peace. Oh, don't play around with witchcraft. It is an evil thing before Almighty God. Then the next thing, not only are we spiritually dead, not only is the devil trying to control us, thirdly, do you realize you're under the wrath of God? Under the wrath of God. What a word to say. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, and following his desires and thoughts, like the rest we were, we were, by nature, objects of wrath. Did you get that? You walk in the way of sin. You walk in the way of disobedience. And we are by nature objects, says the word of God, of wrath. Francis Schaeffer, the great Christian apologist, says, There is no real preaching of the Christian gospel except in the light of the fact that, the, that man is under the wrath of God. There's no real preaching of the gospel unless we realize that man is under the wrath of God. Deuteronomy 28, 28. The Lord will affect you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. Proverbs chapter 1, 27. I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock you when calamity overtakes you. Malachi 4, 1, surely the day is coming and it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble that day is coming, will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them, Malachi 4, 1. You see, Almighty God is a holy God. He is a holy God. And God hates sin. God hates sin, he hates pride, he hates those who disobey him, he hates it. Because he is pure and holy, and he cannot allow any unholiness in him. And so he has to reject it. So John MacArthur says the gospel message begins with a statement about the wrath of God. Frankly, that is diametrically opposed to most of our evangelistic techniques. Most of our contemporary evangelism purposely avoids the theme. My dear friends, you are under the wrath of God. Oh, my friends, you are. Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes and those who are disobedient. The wrath of God is coming upon those who are disobedient. Romans 5, 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the God's wrath through him? He is saved in the cross of Christ from the wrath to come. Matthew 25, 30, and for all that, Worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 Why people are saying peace, peace, safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as the labor pains on a pregnant woman. They will not escape. The word of God diametrically says that all of us are under the wrath of God even if we are walking a good life. But do not believe in Jesus Christ. We are under his wrath. We are under his judgment. Oh, I know that many of you will say, Jay, but I am a good person. But I am a good person. How can I be under the judgment of God? Because, my friend, you don't know how great God is and you have no idea how great your sin is before him and that is your great tragedy you're heading 
for a lost eternity. You're heading for judgment and the wrath to come because your view of God is small and your view of sin is small. And I would advise you to read the Word of God, to study it and realize your true condition. And then fourthly, we've looked at, do you realize you're, you're, you're spiritually dead? Do you realize there is a devil? Do you realize you're under the wrath of God? Fourthly, are you saved by grace? Imagine you had a friend and you hit them in the face repeatedly four or five times for no reason because you just were malicious. One day you're over in, in Cornwall and you're walking along the cliffs of Cornwall. Suddenly you fall and you're hanging off the cliff and that person that you hit five times sees you they run, they throw a rope down, and they pull you up. You didn't deserve their help, but they helped you. In a way, that's the grace of God. We walked in the way of sin, and we slapped God in the face every day. But God came down in the form of His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. When you were dead in sin, God went to the cross and died on the cross for you. And he rose again. And he offers you this free gift of salvation. Isaiah 53 verse 4. This is about Jesus Christ. The prophecy of Jesus. And what he did for you at the cross. Surely he took our, our, upon our infirmities. And he carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God. Smitten and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds... We are healed. Isaiah 53.4 By his wounds we are healed. You see, Christ was crushed for you. The wrath of God came upon Christ. The judgment came upon the Son of God. As the Son of God was nailed to the cross, it should have been you nailed to the cross. As the Son of God was in agony, it should have been you in agony before Almighty God. But instead, Jesus took the judgment and the agony and the punishment for you so that you can be forgiven and have peace with God. Isaiah 44, 7 For a brief moment I abandon you but with deep compassion I will bring you back. God wants to have compassion on you and have mercy upon you today. The Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger abandoned in love. Psalm 103, verse 8 You say, Yay! My life is full of sin, full of wrong, full of guilt. My answer to that is Titus 3, 4, 7. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things <coughs> we had done, but because of His mercy He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us generously, generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour. So that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour. God was generous in giving His Son, generous in allowing His Son to die for you, my friend. Here's a picture of the mercy of God. Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. He says, Luke 15 verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, 
their wasted possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatty calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and dancing. But here's a picture of a, a son who says to his father, I want to do it my way. And he went off, he did it his way, got his inheritance, sold his money, spent his money, lived a, a life of, of sexual promiscuousness, and then he came to an end in himself. He went back to his father, and his father put a ring on his finger and a robe round him and treated him as if he never sinned. And that's like you and me. We do our own thing. We go our own way. We fall flat on our face, and then we come back to God and say, God, be merciful. And God welcomes us with open arms. My dear friend, God wants to shower upon you today his wonderful grace and mercy. There is a new start for you today. You might have been dr on drugs for 40 years, but today is a day where you can be forgiven and have a new start. You might have been a prostitute for 30 years. You might have slept with thousands of men, but today you can be forgiven and have peace and joy, and as if you've never sinned, you can be cleansed today and know the love of God. And God invites you to his home. He invites you to his table and feast upon his wonderful grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 and 7. And God raised up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming years he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's a rich, rich grace, my friend, that you have been given. And it's up to you now to take it. There's a story that Paul Washer tells of a lady in a, in a city where her daughter left her and went to Puerto Rico. And I think it was Puerto Rico. And the daughter got involved in prostitution and the mother went to find her. The mother went all around the city and put a picture of her and her daughter and put at the back of the picture uh, some writing. She left these pictures, thousands of them, all over the city. Then the girl one day was coming out of a hotel with a client and she went to the toilet and she saw the picture. And on the back of the picture she read, I don't know I don't, I, I don't know who, you, what you have become, and I do not care what you have done. Come home. And God says to you, I don't care what you've become, and I don't care what you have done. Come home. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all you, ha who are weary, and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Ephesians chapter two verse eight for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Are you going to do that today, my friend? Are you going to give your heart to Jesus today and believe in him? as your Lord and Saviour. Will you do that today? Maybe you've heard me in Manchester. 
I don't know. But I ask you today, will you give your heart to Jesus Christ? And attend a church that will build you up. Come to this church, Piccadilly Gardens Community Church. Or any church, if you want me to send you to a church and find out a church for you, let me know. But come and trust in Christ. Only He can save you. And only He can give you peace today. Okay? Let's come before the Lord. Dear Lord, we give you thanks today for your goodness and love. And Lord, I just praise you and give you the glory today. And I pray, Father God, that this message will be a blessing and a help to many people in Jesus' name and for your glory, Lord. Amen. If you have, give your heart to the Lord. Praise God. And I just encourage you to go somewhere to get encouraged. And I, I just encourage you to trust the Lord daily and get into a church that will build you up. Look at the links on this site. And they will be places where you can go to get built up. So please, go forward in Jesus today. Thank you for listening. And take care.